In this video, I'll introduce the concept of the dual meaning of prolog programs. That is, the declarative meaning versus the imperative meaning of each program that we write. But let's start with a familiar example, thiefdemo.pl, where we have a bunch of facts in the knowledge base here that describe who's a thief, who owns what, and who likes what, or in one case, who likes who. And then down at the bottom, we have a rule here. A person will steal a thing if that person's a thief, and that person likes that thing. Uh, we've seen what happens if we query this knowledge base, but consider what happens if I add one extra rule, or one extra fact here, likes John Book. It makes sense John would like his book since he owns it, so why wouldn't he like it? Uh, but what happens if we query this knowledge base now? So let's open up uh, our thiefdemo.pl here, get these on the screen at the same time, and off we go. Um, so, will steal John item. Or in English, what will John steal? And as we've seen before, that's true if uh, item is a car, right? If a uh, person is John, John is a thief, John likes car, so John will steal the car. Okay, we can backtrack, John also likes Mary, so he'll steal that. And John also likes the book, so he'll steal that. But that doesn't really make sense, right? The, if John already owns the book, then why would he steal the book? So there's something wrong with this rule here. So let's change the rule a little bit and see if we can't come up with a slightly better solution. So let's change this so that uh, we'll also say uh, not owns person thing. So if a person doesn't already own the thing and they're a thief and they like that thing, then they will steal it. So all three of these terms need to be true in order for uh, the entire rule to be true. So a person will only steal a thing if they don't already own it they're not, a, or sorry, they are a thief, and uh, they like that thing. So let's save this and see what our new rule does. Thief underscore demo. Uh, first off, let's ask, will John still steal the car? John car. Will steal John car. In that case, true. Great. So John will still steal the car because he likes it, he doesn't yet own it, and he's a thief. Makes sense. Uh, but what about will steal uh, John item? What will John steal? And if we query this, we get false. In other words, nothing. There's nothing according to this knowledge base that John will steal. And that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, right? Because we've seen he'll already steal the car. So what's going wrong here? Now, as it turns out, here we're falling victim to the imperative meaning of our program. So declaratively, this rule makes sense, right? A person will steal a thing if they don't own it, if they're a thief, and uh, if they like that thing. So if these three things are true, uh, in no particular order, then the whole thing is true, a person will steal something. But let's do a trace here and see what's actually happening. If we say, will steal John, comma, item. So first off, that the query here matches the, the head of our rule, will steal person thing, where person is John and thing is this unbound variable item. So will steal John something, okay? Now, in order to prove that's true, it has to walk through the, the terms of the body, the first one being not owns person thing. So not owns uh, John thing in this case. Uh, now there's two steps there. First, we have to prove that John owns uh, thing, oh, sorry. In order to prove the not, we have to first prove the inner part of that not. So owns John and then an empty variable. Now owns John empty variable is asking, does John own anything? Right? Um, and that's true, right? Because John owns a book. So John owns a book, so this is true, uh, which means, so exit's in green here, so it means it's success, uh, which means not this is going to be false, right? So if we said this part's true, owns person thing is true, then not owns person thing comes back false. Um, right, and in that case, uh, the whole thing fails. So if, if this first term is false, then it never even gets to asking these other two, and the whole thing becomes false. There's no way to prove that a person will steal a thing because John already owns something, which isn't what we meant to say. So the problem here is that when we get to this part here, owns person thing, we're not asking, does John own the thing he's going to steal? We're asking, does John own anything? Right? And then not says, well, if he does own something, then false. So does John not own anything? Is he a monk? And John's not a monk because he owns one book, therefore he won't steal anything, which doesn't really make sense in terms of the, the domain we're trying to construct. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned here, we're falling victim to the imperative 
meaning of these programs, which is to say it tries to satisfy this clause first before coming down to these other clauses. But uh, what, the reason that's a problem is because when we go to ask owns person thing, uh, when we ask owns John empty variable, that's true if that's anything, right? If John owns anything. But if we asked owns John, let's say, uh, here, go to abort, uh, no debug. If we said owns John car, for example, right? That comes up false. But owns John anything, does John own any single item? That's always going to be true in this case because John owns a book. So it doesn't matter if we're asking, will John steal? Uh, if later on we want to know, will John steal the car or Mary, as our cases were, uh, that never comes to be the considered because we ask, does John own anything? Or rather, does John not own anything? So, owns John with a, a variable here, that'll match with anything. Owns John with car, that will only match, or sorry, with an atom here, uh, that will only match that specific thing. So if we reverse the order of these rules, Like so, save and reload our query, or sorry, our knowledge base, thief, demo, load. And what this new rule means is uh, when we ask that same query, let's actually just trace and we'll explain as it goes, uh, will steal John item. So first the, uh, the query that we wrote matches the rule, so that's great, where uh, person is John and thing unifies with this unbound variable item. Okay. Uh, now, in order to prove the the rule, we have to prove the body of the rule, starting with the first clause, which is now thief person. Okay, so is John a thief? Sure enough, he is because of the fact thief John. Uh, so that succeeds and goes on to the next part of our rule, which is likes John something. Now, this is a much different question than owns John something, right? Uh, but when we succeed by unifying likes John something with, for example, likes John car, uh, creep, then likes John Carr. Uh, then what happens next is when we ask not Joan, not owns John something, that something is now bound to Carr. Right? As soon as we find likes person, likes John Carr here, the variable thing gets unified with Carr all throughout this entire rule, uh, including on this next line. So if we continue to creep here, now we're asking not John not owns John a car specifically. We're no longer asking, does John not own anything? We're asking, does John not own specifically the car? And we creep through. Uh, in the case, John does not own the car, so that's false. Not that then becomes true. So then we've proven the, the body of the rule, and the whole thing becomes true. The item is car. Now let's backtrack and see uh, what happens. So we ask, what else will John steal? Let's just creep through. Mary ends up working the exact same way. He doesn't own Mary, so he will steal her. Um, and let's see what happens when we get to uh, the book. So, a, uh, a third thing that John likes is the book. So then it comes down to the next line. It says, not owns John book. Owns John book is true. So if we reverse that, we get uh, false because not owns John book is false. Um, so then in that case, we can't prove that he'll steal it because he already owns it. Okay. So uh, the important point here is the order of the rules was the only difference between uh, getting a reasonable answer that John will steal uh, two things that he likes but doesn't already own, um, and getting an unreasonable answer where John will steal his own thing, or as we saw before, he won't steal um, anything indiscriminately but will only steal specific items. So there's a declarative meaning here where we're interested just that all three of these things are true, and an imperative meaning uh, where the order of those things, the process that, it, that uh, Prolog uses in order to satisfy our queries, gets evaluated one step at a time. Um, and in order to be a proper Prolog programmer, we need to be able to understand both of those definitions. So let's talk about these definitions in a little bit more detail. So as I said, Prolog admits both a declarative and an imperative reading of its programs. The declarative meaning, or the logic of the program, describes the problem domain via facts and rules, a sort of conjunction of assertions that collectively describe the universe as we want it to be known. Then a goal or a query is posed to the system, and the 
underlying prolog system uh, uses a goal-driven process known as backward chaining to determine if that goal is satisfiable. So for example, um, we have a rule here. X is a bird if X has wings and X lays eggs. Okay. To the declarative meaning, this means for all X, if X has wings and X lays eggs, then X is a bird. It's a declarative statement about the domain. The goals uh, for satisfying that statement can be satisfied in any order. The clauses can be specified in any order. The query simply asks, does there exist an X such that this is true? Okay. On the other hand, the imperative or the procedural meaning more directly uh, is describing the control of the system. So it's the process by which Prolog steps through rules and attempts to satisfy a list of goals. Ideally, this is going to be transparent to the Prolog program. It's just going to be completely invisible. They can't see that uh, Prolog's doing these processes because it's supposed to be a purely declarative language where the programmer can focus on uh, the logic and not the control. But modern computers, as I've mentioned before, are imperative machines, and reality has a bit of an imperative bias. So in effect, in order to have a purely declarative language, it has to be built on top of an imperative abstraction underneath. So as it turns out, the order of facts and rules, and the order of conditions in the body of a rule become very important, as we just saw in the previous example. So these determine the way that a prologue searches through the database. Uh, the prologue is going to search uh, top down through the, the different facts and rules in our knowledge base and satisfy the body of a rule from left to right, or from the first clause to the second clause to the third clause, in order. So for example, um, X is a bird if X has wings and X lays eggs again, uh, to the procedural or the imperative meaning means in order to prove that X is a bird, first we try to prove that X has wings, then we try to prove that X lays eggs in that order. There's a, a description of a process that needs to be followed step by step like a, an imperative algorithm. So uh, in the next video we'll look at the resolution algorithm to see Prolog's uh, proper step by step process of solving through these searches.